Sounds great. So um, good morning, everybody. Uh, big thanks to uh, Dr. Randy D'Amico and Josh Katz for inviting us to give this overview of um, structure, an integrated view of the brain or uh, another title for it would be The Brain and Its Friends and Neighbors, which is an actually a, actually a um, name of a week in our curriculum here. Uh, I'm Robert Hill. I'm an anatomist at the Zucker School of Medicine, and I'm joined today by Dr. Rosemary Bassey and Shannon Knutson, both anatomists who work in the Department of Science Education here at the Zucker School of Medicine. Um, and I'm happy to have this opportunity to share with you a little bit about structure in our curriculum. So, um, one thing that's almost synonymous with the first year of medical school is the anatomy lab, where the focus is dissecting the human body and understanding all the parts and where they are in relation to one another. Um, at the Zucker School of Medicine, we have an anatomy lab. Um, elsewhere, it's called a, a cadaver lab or a gross anatomy lab. Uh, at the Zucker School of Medicine, we call it the structure lab. And the reason for that is because the donor body, while we do some dissection, is not the only focal point. Um, it's one among a multitude of resources. And we really focus on integration of those multiple resources and integration of multiple disciplines. Uh, so as you can see at the bottom there, we made the very deliberate choice to call this the structure lab because what's integrated is uh, the multiple disciplines of anatomy, embryology, histology, which is microscopic anatomy, um, medical imaging, and then also pathology, both gross and macroscopic, um, growth and microscopic pathology. Uh, and we do this by way of a dialogue-based approach uh, where students prepare ahead of time and then they come to class ready to solve problems. And so what you can see in that first image is uh, some of our students, they're kind of intently looking at this screen over here where the professor has presented a problem and they're applying the knowledge that they've gained from uh, reading the night before. Uh, just a little side note, the students that you see here were photographed in their first year, but these are actually the students who just graduated in April. They graduated uh, early without very much pomp and circumstance to their graduation ceremony to enter the workforce early uh, and start to address the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so you can see kind of the, the beginning of their journey here in our structure lab. Um, everything we do in the structure lab is couched in clinical terms. And so we see normal structure alongside pathology and talk about treatment. Uh, there's, there's really not a single focus on basic science. We look at normal, abnormal, and interventional, uh, kind of all, all in one place there. Um, and the result is that our students kind of never ask, when will I need to know this? You've all certainly had this experience where you, you learn some little fact and you say, when am I ever gonna use this in my career, in my life? Um, and our students don't really ask that question because the basic science facts are paired up really nicely and integrated with their clinical application. Um, the way we make that work is we have a team of faculty that includes some of the anatomists that are gonna be talking to you today. Um, but also a large number of, of faculty who come from outside, who come from the health system. And so they're learning and not just anatomy from me, but they're also learning its application from doctors in the health system. And um, Dr. D'Amico, if you're on the call, since you've invited us here, let this serve as uh, your cordial invitation to come join us and teach in the Structure Lab. Uh, our brain block starts in January, so save the date if you would. Um, so we're gonna try to model one of our typical structure sessions for you today. So you can get an idea of um, what a typical structure station would be like. This would be like a 30 minute station where students are gathered around here solving problems. And um, we're gonna try to model that for you today. So uh, to kick it off, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Bassey, who will present uh, some higher order questions of the type that we usually present to our students. So Dr. Bassey, go ahead. Okay, thank you, Dr. Hale. Um, so we'll kickstart this session with a brain teaser. Um, okay, so who's ready for that? Next slide, please. Okay, let's see. So what we're gonna do here is look at the questions, the higher order questions, 
um, they're not really questions, they're like statements and try to match them up with the area of the brain that you can find this. So um, let's get started with A. Let's start with A. <laughs> I, I've already seen E, Rachel. Um, so, okay, number five. So what is number five called? Central sulcus. So what is the central sulcus? What is the, what does it separate? So this is the central sulcus, as we can see here. Right, so what does it divide the sensory and motor cortex? Yeah, frontal and parietal lobe, that's good, that's good. Okay, what about B? B, two, two, what is two? Frontal lobe, okay. Personality and emotions, that's good, that's good. Um, there's a case of a, a famous uh, footballer that had a frontal lobe injury. So what what happened? What would what would happen if you have um, frontal lobe injury or lesion? In this case, we're talking about mood change, emotional problems, more aggressive. Exactly, and he ended up being jailed um, for murder. So. These are not all the frontal lobe does, but that, that is a good idea. That gives you a good idea of what it does. Um, what of C? C, four, okay. So what is four? Parietal lobe. Okay, good, good. Okay, um, what about D? Three, what is three? Temporal lobe. Um, what is the, what is this feature here that se separates the temporal lobe from the rest of the cerebral hemisphere? The C Sylvian feature, that was quick, okay. <laughs> okay, so that leaves us with E, right? E, everybody should know E, occipital lobe, perfect. That, that went really well. Okay, let's move on to the next one. Good job, okay. Um, this is easy, but let's start with what view are we looking at? What view of the brain are we looking at here? Sagittal, okay. Specifically, mid-sagittal, because it's like perfect. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's good. So let's see. Let's start with A. This should be pretty easy. You guys got mid-brain, exactly. Okay. Um, so what about B? One, what is one? Medulla oblongata. And you can see one here. So what is the part? So we can have the spinal cord continuous with that. That's perfect. So what's this part here in the middle here? The remaining part of the brainstem. The pons, perfect. Perfect. Awesome. Okay, so that leaves us with C. Two. What is two? Cerebellum. Oh my god. Everybody's here is an expert. Okay. Uh, so you can see from the brain teasers, we've successfully looked at the topography of the brain, right? Just by doing that. Perfect. Okay, next slide. And actually, before we move on, Dr. Bassey, I just wanted to point out, uh, everybody did great on that little brain teaser. Mm -hmm. And the only difference of uh, the way we would present this in our structure lab is that there's 1,200 students in attendance instead yes. of about five or six. We usually try to aim for really small group interaction. And that's, it's kind of a double-edged sword because our students, um, our students can't hide in a group that small. And so they need to be really prepared to be able to answer questions like this. The other thing that I wanted to point out is that um, the questions that we ask are of a second order or application type. So you notice Dr. Bassey didn't ask you, hey, where's the cerebellum? Instead, she asked, which is the part of the brain that's involved with posture? And so this is, this is forcing students to say, yeah, I already know the brain topography, and you guys did great, you know, you're answering kind of uh, fast and furious. Um, but you have to think a little bit further to link and make the connection between that structure and its function. 
Okay, so this is just a cartoon um, that just um, summarizes all that we talked about earlier. Um, basically, we do this so the students can go back and review and make sure this is not all inclusive of all the functions, but just to have an idea of what they generally do. Okay, so next slide, please. Yes, so now we're looking at the different orientations of the human brain. Let's start with A. So from where are we looking at the brain from? What would we call this view? Inferior view, caudal. Yeah, inferior, we're looking at it from the inferior aspect. Yeah. So it's inferior. Yeah, we're looking at it from inferior. But what would you call it in terms of, um, I, I just saw ventral. Why did you say ventral? I'm interested. Embryological development. Good, 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 good. Okay, so we saw ventral. Ventral is correct. Yeah, inferior is also because we're looking at it from below, but the um, most accurate term to call this view is ventral. And that is A. Um, what of B? Anterior view, okay. Anterior view, I saw a lot of posterior. No, it's not posterior. You're posterior. looking at it from this way, right? Because you can actually see, you can see the frontal lobe, you can see the temporal lobe, and you can actually see the brainstem from here, which you can see from, you know, the posterior view, right? So this is actually rostral or anterior, right? Okay, good. What of C though? Superior dosal, dosal view, and it's from superior, yeah, superior dosal is more accurate, especially because of um, the developmental aspect of it, which we're gonna be looking at in the next slide. So I could see a lot of, you know, different um, versions, a lot of different answers, some a little bit of confusion about like, which is the ventral, which is the dosal, and we're gonna look at that in the next slide. And which is important, especially when you're talking about orientation in the brain. Okay, next slide. Yes, yeah, so here we see that um, normally the mammalian nervous system was designed such that the neural tube is aligned, right, from anterior to posterior. Mostly I, um, in a four-legged animal, like here you you're talking about a dog, and mostly due to evolutionary, you know, uh, advancement, um, the homo sapiens went from being four-legged to actually standing upright. And so in the humans though, because the, the eyes are pointing straight forward and the spine is now erect, it still follows that way, but it's just that we now have a 90 degree um, curvature up here, right? And so you still name the uh, view of the brain according to how it was in the dog, right? So you have the, Dosal will still be the dosal part of like the spine up onto the head in the dog. The ventral one will also reflect the, that same part. So you see the ventral will go up onto the jaw, as you can see in the dog. And that will tell you the same way you would view the brain in, the, um, in a human. So if you compare, let's say the views on the right, right, comparing the rostral, caudal, dosal, and ventral view in the dog is still the same as that of a human, right? Okay, so no comments regarding to that. Okay, perfect. So, but with every living tissue, next slide, please. With every living tissue, it needs nutrition to stay alive. You know, it needs oxygen. And now we're going to look at the blood supply to the brain. So who has any idea how blood supply gets to the brain? 
Any ideas? What What is the source of? Yes, there's anterior and posterior circulation, carotid arteries. Yeah, carotid, that internal carotid. Yes, that's what I was looking for, right? Okay, and vertebral arteries. Okay. I like uh, the, no. the heart and the aorta in there too. Yeah, I, I'm just, <laughs> no, it's not from the aorta. It's not from the aorta. Both the vertebral arteries and the car and internal carotid uh, are from the subclavian, right? But, yes. but ultimately from the aorta and the heart. Yeah, but ultimately, exactly, but that's so way down. <laughs> okay, let's get to the next slide. Circle of wheelies, okay, yeah, so you already know about that. So this would be one of the sources of um, blood supply, yeah, contributing to the circle of wheelies. So what does, uh, what does the internal carotid artery contribute? How does it contribute to the circle of willies? So what branches? Any idea? ACA and MCA, I'd say, okay, so that's the anterior cerebral artery, right? And the middle cerebral artery. Okay, let's look at it from, are you seeing my mouse? I'm not sure. Okay, so the ACA here, anterior cerebral artery, and the MCA, the middle cerebral artery here. Cool. And so that's the anterior contribution to the blood supply, to the circle of Willis, yes. Okay, so how about the vertebral artery? How does it fit in here? So these are the two vertebral arteries, right? Vesila artery, yes. Then Okay, <laughs> used in the on the pons, perfect. That's on the pons. So it brings, it contributes the posterior cerebral artery, right? So that is what is the um, posterior contribution to the blood supply in the brain. So what makes this a full circle now? So what? How does it anastomose? What is that thing that connects the um, anterior and posterior contributions? So we have these two. Um, the anterior communicating artery. Okay. How? Yeah, that is up here. Yeah, that only connects the two anterior cerebral arteries. It doesn't connect the anterior contribution and the posterior contribution to the circle of Willis. Yes, the posterior one. So this is the posterior communicating artery here. And you can see how it kind of causes um, anastomosis with um, the anterior contributions, right? So you have the posterior cerebral artery here, and the posterior communicating artery now fuses it to the um, branches of the um, internal carotid artery. Good. So it now forms a full circle, right? It's almost going through traffic you know, circle here, right? And you can see that on the right um, diagram, the one on the brain. So that is how you would see it on um, a brain tissue, right? So it forms a full circle. So do aneurysms occur at the areas of bifurcation? That, I mean, that, yeah, those are possible. And why do we have, one question I have to ask is, of what benefit do we have, um, do we derive from having this anastomosis, really, of blood supply from two different areas? Arteries can take over. Vicky, how do they take over? Division of blood flow, yes. Yes, if one gets blocked, another supply can help. Exactly, it, that could, yes, definitely. Better circulation. Of course, the brain tissue is a huge, is huge, and each of these um, arteries get to supply different areas of the brain. So yes, but col a collateral circulation definitely is something, yeah. Next slide, please. Yes, and so from what we're talking about, we can see how there's almost like division of labor here with the anterior cerebral artery supplying 
this part of the brain, mostly most of the medial aspect of the brain and the superior aspects, like superior and medial aspects of the brain. Yeah. So how about the middle cerebral artery? How does it get to supply mostly the lateral part of the brain? Where does it pass through to get to the lateral part of the brain? We looked at different fissures and areas. We yeah, are M1, M2, and M3. Yeah, the pathway is, it mostly goes into, oh, my lights are off. Anyway, so yeah, so it mostly goes through the sylvian fissure, passes through there, and goes to supply mostly the lateral aspects and sends in some branches up on the temporal lobe. But what about the posterior cerebral artery? So we can see it mostly around the occipital and inferior aspects. So the sylvian fissure is this fissure here that separates the temporal lobe from the other parts of the cerebral hemisphere. Uh, yeah, okay, no problem. Any questions with regards to this, to the blood supply? No? Okay. I'm handing it Great. back to you. All right, thanks. And and I, I can't emphasize enough uh, how important getting down this basic framework is. Like these questions that are being asked, um, you know, uh, where is the Sylvian Fisher located? What view are we looking at it from? These are things that are uh, just second nature to physicians who've been practicing in the field for years. Um, but you have to build it up from a firm foundation. And so these, these questions are uh, important to really start with. All right, so now we're going to go live to our correspondent, Shannon Knudsen, who's going to show us some of the um, specimens that we would see in our structure lab. And Josh, I don't know, can you um, spotlight Shannon's video for us? Yep. And do I need to stop sharing for that, or can we do it anyway? I think you do need to stop sharing, actually. Okay, I will stop sharing. And oh, there we are. I think she's spotlighted now. All right, can everyone hear me is a different question. Yeah, yep. awesome. Got, yes, okay. I'm trying to stand so that I can also see the chat, so we'll see how this angle goes. But please let me know if I'm screaming at anybody. Anyway, so this is that lovely famous circle of Willis that you just saw in those lovely drawings. And so here it is actually fresh from a lovely brain. And it's really, you can see my hand next to it, it's not very big, is it? It's actually quite a small structure, and I'll show it to you in C2 in a moment. It's very, this is very laid out and stretched out and made very pretty and nice to see. So it looks like the diagrams you just saw. This is not at all what it looks like in the brain. It's actually bent around plenty of corners and shoved into those sulci that we talked about. So it's very hard to actually see it this laid out and nicely so you can map it. So I did you the ease of color coding to the last pictures that we just saw. So can anyone tell me what this nice little red marker was that we just spoke about attached to this lovely giant artery? Yeah, so that's gonna be your MCA. That's your middle cerebral. That's how big this thing is, which I know it doesn't seem very big outside of the context of most arteries, but for the brain, that's a lot of space to take up. So that's heading out to what area of the brain that we just spoke about? Yes, a very large lateral portion. It covers most of the lateral side of your brain. What about this lovely yellow pin that we just spoke of? Yes, that's your ACA. That's your, a that's your, sorry. That is your anterior cerebral artery. I can't speak today either, which is very helpful when you're giving a presentation. So that's your anterior cerebral artery. So where are we going to head with most of its flow? Yes, you're going to go much more medial with this one. It's going to be medial and it's going to be very superior in its function. And then right here is that little communicating branch that we mentioned for a moment. Does anybody remember what this tiny little th connection is between the two anterior cerebrals? 
Yes, anterior communicating. Very useful. And then, of course, your lovely blue pin, which I know I have a blue background, so we'll have to just do that for a moment. But yes, that's your posterior cerebral artery. So where are we going to go with this one? What's its main function? Yes, it's going to go do basically your entire occipital lobe, going to go very posterior, and it's actually going to do a fair portion sharing with your middle on what lobe? Yes, exactly temporal. You're going to have a large, about half of your temporal lobe is done by your posterior and about half is done by your middle, depending on whether you're talking about the superior portion of it or the inferior portion of that lobe. So now that we've seen this lovely and all pinned down and held together so it's a nice straight lines and everything, let's look at it more in C2. And for that, we have an entire human brain. So if I arrange it very nicely for you this way, what way are we then viewing it again? Yes, this is going to be that superior dorsal view that we talked about. This is as if you opened somebody's skull and looked directly down at their brain. So this is going to be the top of their brain. And then in order to see the lovely circle of will as we just left, we're going to turn over to what side? Ventral and inferior, exactly. So this actually, right here, anyone remember what this nice big artery was leading up to the circle? Yes, basilar. Basilar is this nice thick one right on top of what structure that we spoke of? Pons, there we go. I got a lot of people to get that one in a second. So this is actually that nice circle. It actually loops up underneath here and continues around this way. So this is just that bottom portion of that circle. So if we're looking for those different arteries that we just gave off, that means that this is going to be that posterior branch that we spoke of a moment ago. Your middle is of course going to be way up here, coming through that sylvian sulci that we spoke of, and going out to do this large lateral side. And then that anterior one that we spoke about is going to be up here behind, can anybody tell me what these are? This lovely little joint right here, this chiasm that leads to these two. Yes, there are your optic nerves against your optic chiasm, which is what this X shape is. Right behind that is going to be that anterior that we talked about. So now that we've caught up on the blood supply for all of that, let's actually go over what we spoke of already in our other brain teasers. So you have this lovely lobe right here up at the front. Yes, the X shape underneath is the optic nerve, so they actually cross each other. But yes, yeah, so we have this lovely lobe right up at the very front, which gives it its own lovely name. Yes, the frontal lobe. I play everything like a bad game show. There is the central sulcus right here that we spoke of before, very nice and defined and easy, leading to this lobe right here. Parietal, yes, my chat is so lovely, look at you. And then down here, of course, we're going to have temporal, which is going to lead to all of your ability to com compute the things that I'm telling you. And then back here, of course, we have occipital, which will be computing what these optic nerves give off. So in order to see a more midsection, because we don't want to cut this right now, I've already prepared a nice little cut one for you. And so this is what kind of view again? A mid sagittal, very specific. We've learned so much from Dr. Bassey. So speaking about this, so this was one of your answers. Where are we here? That's your midbrain, exactly. 
So this is going to be the highest portion of your brain stem, which is all this right here. And this was where that basilar artery was laying on before. So that's your pons, this nice little circle. It's very defined actually. And then this is that continuation, right? Lovely medulla oblongata. And this tiny little bell that hangs under your brain is the cerebellum. Now, if you want to talk about whether something is continuous or not with a spinal cord, I suppose I should prove it to you. So, this is a brain, as we just saw. And this is the medulla that we just saw. And this is an entire human spinal cord that we removed all in one lovely piece for you. And now you'll notice that down at the end here, it's a lovely cord. It's very defined. It's a lovely cord that gives off all of these nerves at different levels and you can see all of the rami together. It's very pretty. And you can see all these lovely meninges still wrapped around it and all these pieces. These dorsal root ganglia, which is these little knob looking things. And it's a nice solid cord until you get down to about here. And then it kind of looks like it starts to fray. Well, is it deteriorating? What, what's happening here? A lot of you are riding horsetail. Yes, yeah, so these are actually individual nerve endings. They're called cauda equina, which is why some people were saying horsetail, because that's what it actually tends to look like, is a horsetail. So this is what happens to your spinal cord down at the end, down by your sacrum. It will actually start to divide around L1, L2, depending on the person. And it will actually start to divide here and become individual nerve fibers to continue on because eventually you run out of spine for it to be housed in. So then all these nerves can't travel as a solid cord together anymore. They have to go ahead and split off of the spinal cords so that they can go do their jobs down in the legs. And now can anyone, very extra credit question, can anyone tell me what this is right here? This very central point here. Yes, exactly, Sarah. Phylum terminale. This is the very, very, very last strand of your spinal cord as a whole thing. And it will actually go down to the very tip of your sacrum because it's not actually a nerve. It doesn't have any nerve tissue in it. It just continues down and is used as an anchor point at the end of your sacrum to hold your spinal cord down there so that it can't wiggle around inside of your spine. But isn't that neat? A whole human spinal cord and a brain. And with those meninges that I just talked about actually, I'm actually going to go ahead and give it back to Dr. Hill back upstairs because he's going to tell you all about what the meninges are and how you can figure out different hemorrhages and blood flow. All right, thanks so much, Shannon. Um, getting a lot of great feedback in the chat uh, as to uh, that being just a really exciting visual representation of the structures we're talking about. So maybe we should make a uh, popular TV show out of this, Shannon's Brain. Tune in every hey. week. Hey, I've already said we should start an Instagram. But <laughs> All right. Uh, so let's move on. And I think that one thing to take away from the dissections that Shannon just showed us, uh, and it's something that our students take away from the lab experience too, is how unbelievably fragile some of these structures are. You saw the incredibly delicate little branches of the circle of Willis. You saw the soft brain tissue and um, some of those, those nerve fibers as well. And just trying to open the chat window so I can see what everybody's saying. Um, the um, the uh, delicate nature of those structures really makes it make sense that it should be well protect those structures should be well protected inside the skull. So go ahead and um, you know put your hands on your own head. You feel skin and hair, and 
deep to that, right beneath it, you feel the, the firm bone of your skull. And all that's separating your fingers right now from the brain tissue that you just saw is about one centimeter's worth of tissue. Um, but in that centimeter are multiple layers and they're arranged kind of like nesting dolls in concentric fashion, uh, concentrically enveloping the brain. So right here, you can see the scalp that you would have been touching, uh, the bone of the skull, and then deep to that are the meninges. And I bet there's some people on the call who know what they're called from, from internal to, uh, sorry, from external to internal, there you go. Thank you, Tedrick, uh, dura, arachnoid, and pia. Right? And this is one of those cases where the anatomical names can help you out with remembering what the structures are. Uh, so dura is so named because it's durable, it's tough. Arachnoid is so named because like arachnophobia, it looks kind of cobwebby, uh, spidery, thank you. And how about pia? Dura and arachnoid people sometimes know. There we go, pia is the soft mother. Soft, also sometimes faithful or pious. And Pia is pious because it is faithful to every nook and cranny of the brain. It goes down into every sulcus, up onto every gyrus, and it sticks directly, as is being said in the chat. That's perfect. Um, if, you, uh, if you want to model the meninges at home, you can try this. Put on a rubber glove. That's Pia because it's intimately adherent to all of the crevices between your fingers. Um, then put your gloved hand into a fist, that's gonna be your brain with the pee on it, and put that into a fuzzy sock. The fuzzy sock represents the arachnoid. And then after that, you can put the whole thing into a big rubber boot. The rubber boot's tough like the dura. And then people will look at you funny because you have all these garments on your hand, but the joke will be on them because it's you who understand the relationships of the meninges that way. So dura, arachnoid, pia, and that's their relationships. Um, again, this is not just one of these little factoids to remember, but the, the importance is that blood vessels lie between each of these layers. Um, and there's different ones at risk depending on many factors like age and patient history and so on. And so if you're the doctor, you really wanna know where that bleeding is occurring because that will affect how you treat the patient. So question, if you're the doctor, and you're concerned that a patient might be bleeding inside the skull, how would you go about finding out? All right, so we've got a lot of votes for CT, one for burr holes, one for MRI. History would be important. That's great, um, but a lot of people pointing to imaging. Yeah, and absolutely CT scan, which you can see right here, and MRI are two of the most important neuroimaging tools that you have available uh, to try to diagnose the patient. Um, again, going back to the basics, the way that uh, CTs and MRIs work, they, they technologically is different, but they generate very similar images in that they generate a sliced of the body that's always visualized uh, conventionally as though you're looking at the patient from the bottom up. And so that means that the patient's right is over on this side, the patient's left is over on that side. And if you have trouble remembering this, because I always did when I was learning this, if trouble remembering this, this picture down here actually helps with it. Imagine you're walking into a patient's room and you see their feet first coming out towards the door, you can envision a series of slices through their body and looking at them from the bottom up. And that, that, that kind of helps you remember which side is left and which side is right. So I'll tell you for free, this is our normal CT scan of the patient's head. And then down here we have three pathological scans. Now, I don't want you to try to diagnose it, but just, just tell me what you see. We'll start with A and tell me what you see in A that is a deviation from the normal. I'm having trouble seeing the chat. If anybody's, can anybody see some of the answers in the chat? Yeah, I'm seeing bleeding on the right side, bleeding between the meninges layers. Wonderful, yeah. So you're seeing some bleeding on the right side, evidenced by this. And if you have a fruit basket at home, what, uh, 
what item of fruit does this look a lot like? Lemon grapefruit. Okay, an oblong grapefruit, but I'll take here. lemon. Yeah, this is a classic uh, lemon shape right here. You can also see a lot of swelling uh, outside the skull as well. Um, all right, let's move over to this one here. Again, just describing how it deviates from normal. What are you seeing? And Dr. Bass, you'll be my eyes on that chat again, please. Midline shifts, fluid pushing brain against skull. Wonderful observation, a midline shift, right? So this, this straight midline, this beautiful line of symmetry that you see in the normal and even to some extent in this one is bowed way over here. And the ventricles of the brain should be on the midline, but they're bowed way over. And I, what was the second thing you said, Dr. Bassey? Um, bleeding, um, I even say banana. <laughs> banana, all right, I'll take it, I'll take it. Or if you want some pastry with breakfast, this kind of looks like a crescent roll, right? Or a croissant. That's There's perfect. a lot of fluid, fluid. Answers. Yeah. Okay, good. A lot of accumulation of fluid. That's these are great observations. Uh, and then let's go over to this one. Now, this one's actually taken at a little bit lower level. You can see here the frontal lobes and the temporal lobes uh, of, of the brain that, that Shannon and Dr. Bassey were indicating later. So um, it's kind of cheating because we're a little bit lower, but what do you observe here? I'm seeing aneurysms, ischemia, tumor. Okay, so you're making interpretations of aneurysms leading to ischemia, maybe some, some, something uh, like a tumor. Are you seeing this out of place? That's probably just bone, but these are all good observations. And then what shape do you see kind of centrally on this slice? Seeing star. You see a star, right? It looks just like a big starfish, fantastic. Uh, and so all of these are indicative of bleeding, but it can be further localized to where among those layers, where among those meninges the bleeding is taking place. Um, so it's almost like a, uh, it's like a, a, a really bad uh, slot machine that comes up instead of like three cherries in a row, it comes up lemon, crescent, and star. But each one of them points to a specific uh, location of bleeding relative to the meninges. Um, so these are great anatomical descriptions, but they're just observations until we put them in some clinical context. And one thing that we will often ask our students with a question like this is, tell your patient's story. I know some of you are starting to think, okay, did this person have an aneurysm? Um, did this person have trauma? I don't know if, it, if that was in the, the chat as well. Um, so we don't have time to ask for, a, uh, for you to write a story about each of these patients. Uh, sometimes we'll even make it fun. We'll say, okay, let's say you had these three patients to report on, and as you were running down the hall, you dropped the CAT scans on the floor and they got mixed up. How are you going to reassociate them with their stories? So here's three stories. They're jumbled up. Take one minute to look at these. We have a healthy 30 year old man with sudden double vision and his words, the worst headache of his life. We have an 82 year old woman who is hanging curtains when the rod fell and bumped her on the head. And then we have a college baseball player who was struck in the side of the head by a line drive. Let's say he's a pitcher. The batter got all of that pitch and it, it, it went right and, and cracked him in the side of the head. All right. So let's start with our patient over here. A, what history do you want to match that um, radiographic finding up with? I'm seeing the um, basketball, baseball players. I'm seeing baseball, curtain, 82 year old. <laughs> okay, so we have a mix, we have a mix yeah. of answers. Okay, that's good. Um, let's, go to, let's go to B. I guess we're gonna get a mix of answers for all of them. Maybe. Most are saying the 82 year old. Okay, that's good. We're converging towards our 82 year old patient there. And then see what's left. Um, see 30, 30 year old, 30 year old. Okay. Yeah. Good. Yeah, so it seems like the consensus that we're getting from our group here, and this is what we would hope to get from our small group of medical students, is 
exactly what you all said, matching up this classic radiographic finding of a lemon-shaped lesion on the inside of the skull with this history. Doesn't have to be this history, but it matches up best with that history. Um, our crescent shape with the 82-year-old woman hanging curtains, and then this person, otherwise healthy, who suddenly had double vision and the worst headache of his life. So um, again, this is how they, they most likely line up. And I think the doctors on the call and some of you with a little bit more experience, uh, your minds automatically match them up in this way. But there's a step in between in that thought process. Um, and that's the knowledge and understanding of the anatomy that's underlying. So let's look at that. The anatomy that's at issue right here is that on the side of the head, you can go and touch this on the side of your own head, it's actually the thinnest part of the skull of all. And um, couple that with the really bad design flaw that there's a major artery running right under that really thin part of the skull, the middle meningeal artery. That artery lies outside the dura, and so this bleeding, if you get hit in the head by a baseball or some similar object, is gonna start to accumulate between the dura and the skull. Um, this is really dangerous. We saw the, the uh, recommendation of burr holes to relieve that pressure because these patients will all often go unconscious, then they'll wake up and have a lucid interval and then rapidly decline unless you remove that pressure. Uh, so that's got to be treated emergently. That's called an epidural hematoma because the bleeding is taking place outside of the dura. Where else in clinical parlance, do you hear this term epidural? And Dr. Bassey, um, there's pregnancy, birth, pain management, labor and delivery. There you go. You often hear it in the context of pregnancy and birth, labor and delivery, but pain management is the important thing. Because that space, that epidural space where we see pathologically some blood accumulating, is actually continuous all the way down around the spinal cord where Shannon was showing you earlier. And so the epidural space right here that's a serious medical emergency can also be used therapeutically to introduce pain management medications um, during childbirth, during labor and delivery. Um, let's look at our 82-year-old woman who was hanging curtains. The rod fell and bumped her on the head. I mean, there's, there's no curtain rod in the world that can damage the skull as badly as a 100 mile an hour batted ball. So why did she start to have bleeding in this pattern? What structures were damaged? Um, age, I'm seeing age here. Age, absolutely. What's important about age? You see, this is our older patient, right? And, and what has happened to put her at risk for this particular type of bleed? Osteoporosis, weakened skull, bone loses density. Okay. Um, um, blood thinners. Might be on blood thinners, I like that. Um, what if I told you that there was no fracture at all, right? So there's just a bump on the head. Osteoporosis and bone density are not really an issue here. But what else is going on to the brain as you get older? Shrinking of brain. Wonderful. Yeah, so the brain kind of starts to shrink away from the skull, and it actually puts tension on these cerebral veins. So you can get a, a relatively minor insult, just like a curtain rod bumping you on the head, and suddenly you've got bleeding not outside the dura, but inside the dura, and that's called a subdural or dural border hematoma. Um, this spans out into this crescent shape because it doesn't respect the suture lines, the little interconnecting uh, joints of the skull bones, whereas the epidural hematoma over here, that's going to stop wherever the dura is closely fused to those suture lines. Uh, and then last, I think this is what somebody got right away, was uh, it, it was uh, one, one of our students there was anticipating this question by asking, uh, can aneurysms happen at points of bifurcation? in the circle of Willis, and that's absolutely right. So these are sometimes called berry aneurysms because they look like a little raspberry, and then when they burst, they're bleeding deep to the arachnoid. They're bleeding into the subarachnoid space, and this is a subarachnoid hemorrhage that comes on suddenly. It can come on traumatically, but, it, but if it's a ruptured aneurysm, it's going to arise suddenly like that. Um, and so- there's a, Sorry, oh, there's yeah. a question here. Please, go ahead. Um, does the CSF create tension on the bridging veins 
causing a subdural hematoma in sudden head movements? Uh, good question. So it sounds like you're talking about kind of the, like, because in that subarachnoid space over mm -hmm. here, uh, you have uh, CSF. And if you make a sudden head movement, just imagine holding a basin of water and you suddenly move it, the inertia of that water is going to make it slosh. Uh, so I, it, it does create tension on those cerebral veins, uh, as well as things called the arachnoid villi, which are, which are emptying the CSF into the blood system. Um, whether it's enough to tear those veins and cause one of these hematomas uh, really depends on many other factors, such as the history of the patient. That's a fantastic question. And that's the kind of broadening questions that we like to get our students to ask so that, um, so that they're making connections. And this is the point that I want to leave you with, is that uh, connections are key. Whether you're planning to apply to medical school or whether you're going into any kind of science field, whether you're um, going into an allied health field, whether you've been working in the health related field for years, it's really important to make these kinds of connections because the basic science facts that you know are only as important as your understanding of their application. So these are the kind of connections that we try to build on a daily basis in our structure curriculum. And it's been a um, pleasure to have the opportunity to kind of give you a little demo of that. And hopefully there's some students on here who uh, will join us in a future class. I think we have some time for questions. So thanks everyone for your attention. We've got like two minutes left if you want to see if there are any questions in the chat. A lot of thank yous coming in right now though. Wonderful. Now I can suddenly see the chat again. Thank you. <laughs> thanks everyone for your participation. Oh, I did see a question about the uh, about the recurrent artery of Hubner. That's a that's a deep cut, an obscure one right there. That's a um, branch off of usually off of the anterior cerebral, but it's variable. Mm -hmm. It could be kind of a little further back and kind of turning around and supplying the brain from uh, medially. Yeah, I think you can see that better in an angiograph. Um, yeah. Good point. Imaging always key. We didn't want to make Shannon try to find the recurrent artery of Hubner. That's uh, please don't <laughs> outside of the learning objectives. Uh, I did see a question in the chat about how do you classify between a hematoma and a hemorrhage. Good question. The uh, for our purposes, the um, you know hemorrhage is defined as bleeding. Hematoma is more like a bruise, so it's accumulated bleeding, which can all already have started undergoing some clotting. And another one about how in medical school, do the students look at animal organs as well or only humans? <laughs> Shannon, you want to take that one? Uh, the answer is in our lab, at least, it's all human as far as I've seen in my you know year plus here. Um, everything that we do is all human related. Uh, there are, I have taught and been in some classes where you can have some analogs for things. So like if they wanted to, uh, in some medical schools, if you wanted to actually dissect, say an eyeball, they can get uh, analogs for that, which is usually cows. Um, however, we do use human for our labs. I thought you were gonna mention, Shannon, that in a pinch we can use animal uh, dissections and we were kind of forced to go that way because of the COVID-19 pandemic. We taught our heart and lung course online exclusively. And since we couldn't access our lab, Shannon very bravely got some hearts and lungs from the butcher, uh, pig hearts and sheep hearts to demonstrate those. So in a pinch we'll use uh, animal models, but we'd love to use human whenever we can. Yeah, it turns out you can order organs in the mail. <laughs> All right, I think we're going to have to uh, stop you guys here, but thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Josh, and thanks everyone for participating. Have a great day, everybody. <laughs>